um, you know, it's kind of like really families are like very pleasantly surprised. You know, he takes care of uh, Joe, who's living with Parkinson's. And, you know, it's really awesome to see that great interpersonal relationship has been built that has now lasted for over a year. Um, he's still studying and he's actually going through the medical school application process. And, you know, I think while taking care of somebody consistently for kind of months on end, I think that one, the family's just surprised at, you know, how great the care is compared to kind of any other care experience they've tried and just have the inherent non-monetary motivation in the caregiver, you know, for a student who's aspiring to a future clinical career, who's but many times these caregivers will tell, tell us they do it for free. You know, they just want the experience. Many of them are writing their med school application essays about this. You know, I think that's cool to see. You're listening to Parent Projects, a family media and technology group production. Now here's your host, Tony Siebers. Well, it started with a family caregiving situation between he and his wife, which is uh, something that I think a lot of us start expecting to work through here, has led our, our guest today into understanding how he can help all kinds of people that are stuck in family caregiving situations, whether you're just shorthanded or you're looking for that new approach in order to break through and to find a way ahead. I think you're going to find that what Neil Shaw has to offer us with Kiryaya and just the general approach of making use of multi-generational folks and technology connecting that gig economy into what we're dealing with today, it's going to be something refreshing for you. And Neil, thank you so much for joining us and on the Pair Projects podcast. And I am and I'm excited. I'm hoping to just kind of dive right into what you guys are doing because I I love how you've tackled the market with a fresh perspective of technology. Great. Yeah, Tony, thanks for having me. You know, really appreciate the opportunity. So you uh, you you come in, you, you started with a, you know, a, a situation, a personal situation that we've kind of talked a bit about and being a caretaker, a family caretaker for a family member. But instead of just stopping and figuring out how to build a better mousetrap against that, you really saw some promise in leveraging an untapped group of people who really had a desire and a need to get involved here. How, how did you even come about looking at that type of a problem? Yeah, um, great question. So, you know, basically um, I realized like one of my biggest takeaways, you know, as a, I was in my mid to late thirties when within the matter of two years, um, you know, I really got hit with um, caregiving responsibilities for two different family members, actually uh, my grandfather first uh, through dementia and then later my wife through cancer. And I basically realized like one of the key fundamental challenges was when you can't get good, reliable care help, um, you end up feeling really guilty and doing it yourself. Um, you know, there were so many um, breaks within the care system, um, everything from cost, access, quality, affordability, convenience of booking that really just like leave behind this mid-career, you know, kind of busy midlife person who's faced with caregiving responsibilities. You know, so I thought I thought there was a tremendous opportunity to build something else, you know, um, through Carrie, I, like our nickname for our project is next generation caregiving. Um, but really it has like a double meaning of like next generation of technology, as well as like next generation of like connecting generations, you know, and, you know, to your question, I thought that there was this tremendous untapped workforce of today's youth, um, college students aspiring to healthcare careers, you know, think about our doctors and nurses and physician assistants of tomorrow, um, that make excellent caregivers. Um, but they were really being left behind by the care economy uh, because, um, you know, they're not the care economy is not set up, set up for a geek economy, flexible work solution. So, you know, we thought, why not build one? And that was kind of the genesis of the idea behind Carry Aya. Well, in a great opportunity at that, because it's a it seems to be a really low pressure. Uh, I'm not going to say low hanging fruit, but but it's a low pressure approach that if, you know, I'm trying to have a conversation with my family member about my loved one about having somebody come in and take care of them and they're looking at it's a, it's a nurse or it's a, you know, like just at that level, it, it's, it's more challenging if I can say, hey, we've got a, you know, we've got a nursing student or we have somebody who wants to dedicate their life into helping people <laughs> like us in this situation. Mom, would you, would you sit down? Would you give her like an hour a day or would you let her come in for a couple of hours here to work off of that? Man, that could take so much pressure off. Love that model. What? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think I think you've nailed it. You know, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I I was gonna say when when um, what do you hear from students? Is a 
as the students start approaching this, I, I mean, I could tell as being a family member who has a, that product or the, that, that need in front of me, that project in front of me, what is it that the students are telling you guys that they really want to get out of it? Um, so the students actually are finding just as much meaning um, from the care experiences of the families. You know, initially the students want to get out of it um, exposure to taking care of people, um, pathway to future clinical careers, kind of seeing what it's like helping people. You know, a lot of the people we're helping relieve the care burden enough might be kind of like the midlife family caregiver who's caring for an aging parent um, going through dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Sometimes it's people going through cancer. Sometimes it's people recovering from like major surgeries. Um, and in all of these situations, the students initially enter in thinking, okay, I want to see what these ailments are like. Um, you know, this is kind of like a novel care experience compared to kind of doing rounds at the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually getting to spend mo much one-on-one -on -one time with people, um, seeing the journey, you know, seeing the pros and cons of managing these things, you know, at home and seeing the impact on the family. And it develops a lot of bedside manner and empathy that makes them, you know, prepare better to be future clinicians. That's how they enter, you know, with much more of a practical mindset of, I want to get this care experience in hours. That what actually transforms, you know, as they start doing the care is the development of kind of the relationships, you know, they really get to see um, yeah. and develop medium and long-term relationships with people and kind of like build a lot of um, empathy. And I think the students are deriving a lot of meaning and purpose from doing the work, um, which is like just really awesome and heartwarming to see. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it'd be easy for us just to spend a ton of time just against what you guys do there at Care Yaya, but all that aside, really, it's it's your mindset. I mean, just pivoting here in our conversation around that mindset of how to bridge the gap, and you, you've utilized technology to take two groups that that haven't necessarily wouldn't necessarily jump into each other, or or you know begin mixing that up and start bringing those things in, so that they can they can naturally find the value that we know through the history of mankind. <laughs> There's there's that yes. value there. Is there are there uh, certain cultures or are there any areas that you guys have seen that are that shocked you did, that you expected to see or or things that you you didn't expect to see that maybe came out of these the early days when you guys were kicking off out in North Carolina? Um, probably um, some of the biggest things that we saw um, emerge in the early days was. Um, it started developing almost like a grandkids type relationship. Like number one bit of feedback we got from families was feels like grandkids, um, you know, which wasn't the intent, you know, the intent initially was like, these are college students going to clinical careers and they will help you as like part of like their learning, you know, before they go off and become a doctor or apply to physician assistant school, et cetera. Um, but actually the nature of the interpersonal relationship was the biggest positive surprise that a lot of families started referring to these yayas and, their, you know, their parents are looking forward to when, you know, the care Yaya or the Yaya is going to come. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting because we, we picked the name even Yaya as like a play on words. You know, it means grandmother in Greek. Yeah. Um, it means caregiver in other languages like Swahili and Thai. Um, so we thought that it was like a playful play on words. Um, but it was like cool to see the real life impact that uh, families started kind of like developing this grandkids like relationship. And then the one kind of benefit of that has been, um, I think, you know, to your point, um, families are finding it easier to socialize the care. You know, they're telling mom or dad that we're not getting you a caregiver, but you are mentoring this wonderful college student before they go off and become a nurse or before they go off and become a doctor. Yeah. Um, and I think that's cool because it really helps um, socialize the care, you know, for, for the elder that's getting the help, that you're not just somebody to be cared for, you're actually somebody that's passing on your knowledge and wisdom to the future generation um, and there's kind of mutual benefit. Um, and I think that similarly for the student, you know, the student isn't just there doing something for someone. The student is there learning something from someone about their life experiences and all their wisdom and, you know, their stories. So I think that creating a relationship of mutual benefit, um, I think kind of makes it transcend um, the traditional care experience where one person is being paid to help the other person that needs help. You know, this is kind yeah. of beyond that. And I think that makes it like more fun for both sides. Well, and, and you can enter that conversation with complete in, intellectual honesty there, right? It, it just, it, it is, yeah. it's supported. We see out of a, a lot of, a, a lot of cultures that come down the United States, having so many different cultures here in the U.S. I know we've seen a lot that come out of Eastern Europe and in others in Latin America, yeah. where grandma and grandpa will take care of grandkids. 
parents are out there and mm -hmm. they're the breadwinners working against yeah. that. And then they, they naturally, the grandkids take care of the grandparents later in life. And it builds a rapport with the, with the, um, with mom and dad, because they get to watch their, their kids in action that we, we generally get so busy, I think over the last maybe 20 years or so that, that we, we could have lost wind of that outside of if you lived, if you happen to live in one of those cultural centers and, and now you start introducing that concept, which is rooted on a really valuable time tested, uh, you know, capability. A kid, they're absolutely, 20 year olds are absolutely capable of helping guide and find happiness and give purpose in that handing down of information. Uh, I, I, I really love how you guys have come around to that. Um, and, and more than, than just, just pre presenting that, you're presenting that in a way that speaks into what the, what the, um, the youth are looking for today too. You talk about that gig economy. That's a, that's yeah. a real thing. Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'll add one point to your kind of um, point about the grandkids thing, which I think is just fascinating. And I think actually great case in point, you know, so, um, you know, my family's from India and actually, you know, in most the kind of cities, you live within 10, 15 minutes from parents and grandparents. And that's the way it's been literally for hundreds of years. Right. And like, that's kind of the way America used to be a long time ago. But if you think about in the last three generations of American society, the probability that the midlife child lives within 20 minutes of the aging parent is I think less than 20%. And then the probability that grandchildren live within that is even less, right? So yeah. you have this, you have a society of people, uh, but they're all like pretty scattered. You know, somebody had to move somewhere else for college, then they had to move somewhere else for their job, then second job, et cetera. So I think you have the ingredients of the society, you know, of like a bunch of young people, a bunch of midlife people and a bunch of older people, all of whom want the interconnection. Yeah. But you don't have like the natural like nuclear family mechanism, you know, to kind of build that. So, you know, I think that there is a crisis of like loneliness and isolation. You know, I don't know if I'm sure you hear about this, but like the former G Surgeon General is like going around and doing this big tour across society that loneliness is an epidemic. And, you know, I think it's uh, interestingly, it's not just in elders. You know, I think that they say like one in four above 65 are lonely. Uh, it's worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, you know, all these statistics but also in the youth, you know, right. you know, and you see this in the university population, right. right? There's tremendous loneliness. So I think that kind of building a bridge between the two generations, the way kind of things used to be, yeah. um, and maybe just like, okay, you don't have your own grandchild nearby 10 minutes away, but you have somebody else that you kind of develop this relationship with. I think it can be massively fulfilling and rewarding. And actually one of the hidden benefits we've seen as we've grown carry I is that the um, psychological impact um, on the college students is just as profound as on the elders. You know, I think yeah. students are finding a deep sense of purpose and meaning, um, which is really cool to see. Well, so, and, that, um, and to your point about the gig economy, yeah. oh, sorry again. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. I, oh. I, I was gonna. What I was gonna yes. say is that con that connection, that kinetic connection between human beings is it's just written on our soul. You know, and it, and we can yeah. feel it. I think we all felt that during COVID and that denial off that. I, we, We'd never been yeah. more connected to have more conversations going back and forth with video teleconferencing. It's, I mean, I can I can reach people yeah. I could never reach before very very quickly. Yeah. But yeah. the meaningful, just the, the what what comes from that kinetic, you know, breaking it down. Yeah. I I can't help but think too, you know, if if um, if you even begin here, some of the the hesitation that somebody might have if if my if my mom's he hesitating to not quite know how to engage or how to approach your grandkids or to work something like that, this becomes a really low bar of the approach towards that with somebody else where they really want something she's got, that's knowledge in life and to hear her stories and where those things are going. She can make use of the extra set of hands and start learning again how to turn on these things that we've turned off because we all got isolated against and away from our families yeah. so much lately. I, I could see just just a good, great natural tool for stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's like, it's, it's it's amazing to utilize it for that purpose. And I think to your question about the gig economy, I think that's kind of a critical insight as well, is that the there is a very large care industry in the US, but it's not really set up and optimized for the gig economy. So right. if you consider that there are 20 million college students across the country at any given time, approximately... 15 to 20% of them want to pursue a healthcare career. So you have like almost 4 million students across the country. Um, the 
caregiving industry does not necessarily want them because the caregiving industry to date is focused on a localized staffing model of finding people to staff one-on-one -on -one with families who can do ideally 30, 40 plus hours a week of consistent care. And, you know, guess what? Most students in, you know, in our area at Duke University, UNC Chapel Hill, in your area at Arizona State or other wonderful universities, I mean, these students cannot do that on a fixed schedule. Right. But if you create a gig economy platform, uh, you can create something where um, families can get the care they need during the hours they need. And then students can kind of pick up the opportunities, you know, as they're available. And you just develop like a novel, interesting solution and you unlock this amazing workforce. So uh, I think that's been kind of like a cool, you know, cool thing to observe. Yeah, you know, without a doubt. You know, I do. I, you know what I want to do is I want, I want to take this second for, for a break. When we go through this break, actually, I want to sure. I want to get in. We've got an in-depth explainer video. We're going to we're going to play this. Going to break down a little bit of what you guys are doing there at Care, Care, at Care Yaya. Um, and, and, and so we can for those of you that are having a hard time kind of putting those pieces together, We'll put we'll, we'll we'll throw some of that down for you. When we come back, we're gonna break down into some of those one-on-one -on -one conversations, some of those um, neat things that come out of leveraging technology in order to bring more assisting and more assistance inside caregivers. So stay tuned for the Parent Projects podcast. We'll be right back after this. College students generally have a lot of energy and they're interested in what they're doing. He has many skills that older people need, really. How you doing, Joe? Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you too. I get to make connections with all the different families that I visit and it really helps like me learn bedside manner and other things that I'll need for when I am in nursing. You know, and welcome back. Today we're talking about assisting caregiving with technology. And one of the key pieces of technology that we see out there that is helping to connect uh, other gen multiple generations here uh, at a great high value is uh, is Care Yaya. We've got Neil Shaw. Neil, again, thanks for joining us today, founder of Care Yaya. Neil, those are uh, those. There was a great little demo that that kind of walked down in those testimonials too of what people feel they work. Yeah, I was. It, it, couldn't help but think too that it's not just about nursing. It is anybody that really is going to work in it with a with a geriatric population or just that requires that soft touch of bedside manner to get that practical experience, but not to have to have a forty hour you know work week as a as a not a CNA. I'm trying to think of what the, yeah I guess CNAs is would have been the way that people would have yeah. handled that before, right? And that's and I and I'd had friends that tried that and it was a st stressful load on top of everything else. Um, you, you guys have, have really come up to, to mend that real well. I mean, what are um, for, so what are you guys hearing? What do you hear from from families that are dealing with this um, or, or that are making use of, of having younger people from outside the family come in and start working with mom and dad? Yeah, I mean, I think that probably the number one and two people or the number one and two points that we hear from families are, um, quality, you know, qu kind of quality and reliability of the students, and then price, you know, and affordability. You know, those are kind of points we've really strived towards um, in terms of quality. I think that, for example, you saw, you know, some of the amazing individuals, um, you know, in the video, but Josh, you know, he's aspiring to be an orthopedic surgeon, you know, to get matched with an individual like that, you know, just a very conscientious, like very charismatic, actually, individual, like highly intelligent person. Um, a young man, you know, in a care industry that predominantly is like 90 something percent um, uh, women, um, you know, it's kind of like really families are like very pleasantly surprised, you know, he takes care of uh, Joe, who's living with Parkinson's. And, you know, it's really awesome to see that great interpersonal relationship has been built that has now lasted for over a year. Um, he's still studying and he's actually going through the medical school application process. And, you know, I think while taking care of somebody consistently for kind of months on end, 
I think that one, the family's just surprised at, you know, how great the care is compared to kind of any other care experience they've tried and just have the inherent non-monetary motivation in the caregiver, you know, for a student who's aspiring to a future clinical career, who's but many times these caregivers will tell, tell us they do it for free. You know, they just want the experience. Many of them are writing their med school application essays about this. You know, I think that's cool to see. Um, and then the, the second thing being price, you know, so we are maximum social enterprise. We run the care matching completely free. We decided very consciously not to charge the consumer anything. So the entire amount the family pays goes straight to the caregiver. There's no markup, no middleman fee. Uh, so it's completely counter to the traditional care agencies that are taking, you know, the, in our area in North Carolina, they charge families 30 bucks an hour and they pay the caregiver less than half. You know, average caregiver wage in North Carolina is 12 bucks. Um, so as you can imagine, the families are paying a lot and the caregivers are getting less than half of it. So it's a terrible experience for both sides. Carry yeah, it's the exact opposite. You know, family matches with a caregiver and it's typically 15 to 18 bucks an hour and you pay the person the entire amount. So uh, there's kind of no fee and caregivers are thrilled. They love the transparency. Uh, families are thrilled because they're getting, in my opinion, better care at half the price. Um, you know, so it's kind of a no brainer uh, for both sides. And then the convenience of booking, you know, don't force any contracts, don't force any minimums. It's all kind of schedule and book online. So I think for a busy midlife family caregiver, um, it's almost like a no brainer product that you have very high reliability people. You can leave reviews of each individual caregiver and every care session. Um, you get full price transparency. You get convenience of booking. Um, you can kind of like do it online in two minutes, you know, without going through the whole rigmarole of like dealing with a local provider and signing contracts and, you know, setting up visits. I mean, it's, it's built to be kind of Airbnb Uber like kind of user experience, yeah. um, you know, for like the busy mid career person, which, um, which is a lot of, healthcare, healthcare. right. Which is a lot of who, who these responsibilities are really falling on top of is our parents get disconnected from from uh, with technology, from things that their parents were able to do for themselves, or maybe set up for a longer period yeah. of time, but now all of a sudden they've kind of they they need a little help from their friends, and and that that tends to fall onto us younger and younger. So that's uh, yeah. that's a good. So t tell me when, um, as if someone were to ask too. So where where is it that like a uh, that a care yaw yaw gets paid in that system? How do you guys? How do you guys benefit out of that system when everything passes through and just off of that transparency model for everybody? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question, actually. So we, we don't at all. And the goal is to build it rapidly and build it very large and never uh, take a dime out of the interaction between the family and the caregiver. What our hope is that is that there are very large um, constituencies within the care ecosystem uh, very large businesses who are helping employees manage care needs, very large health insurance plans, such as Medicare Advantage, who are helping uh, take care of populations and insuring them, uh, very large hospital systems who are transitioning to value-based care and have an incentive to keep people out of the hospital, and ultimately, federal government and Medicare. We think um, the care industry has not built anything to par partner with any of these systems. The care industry has optimized their entire business model to cater to kind of the top 1% to 5% upper echelon of the population yeah. um, and has never thought about kind of partnering and building something. So our hope is we'll do the exact opposite and we'll build something completely free to the consumer. Um, caregiver gets kind of the entire amount. And then hopefully over time, as we grow on scale, uh, we can start building partnerships with large employers who are managing family care needs of employees. Even in some of the, in the video you saw, there were some people booking care so that they can go to work. And, you know, shouldn't the, shouldn't the employer start helping out with that? You know, so we thought that would be a, a partnership for us. Um, health insurance plans and hospitals, you know, I think they're being measured now on 30 day readmissions, um, being measured on keeping people out of the hospital. Um, you know, so those are opportunities for us. And then hopefully longer term, you know, I think government, you know, I think Medicare is going to have to step up to the plate and uh, partner um, with organizations to help people manage caregiving needs. And I don't think they're going to partner with $35 an hour local mom and pop agencies. So, you know, I think that a platform like this is imminently um, you know, kind of partnership material at scale as it spreads all over the country. Yeah. Um, and equally on the other side, a lot of uh, people want to partner on workforce development. You know, we are training and inspiring tomorrow's doctors, tomorrow's nurses, tomorrow's physician assistants. A lot of the um, younger individuals who do caregiving through CareIA uh, tell us that without paid care experience opportunities, they might be discouraged from pursuing clinical careers. Oh. And there is a massive and growing shortage of doctors and nurses um, in the field. So uh, we also think as a workforce development, uh, play. Um, uh, a lot of institutions reach out to us and say, hey, this is pretty cool what you, what you guys are doing. So at scale, that could be kind of a
good partnership opportunity. But I think all those, we, we went at it the hard way so that we could keep uh, care effectively free or no fees you know, to families um, and have the caregivers kind of earn their fair share, given that they're doing 99.9% .9 of our work. Yeah, that, 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 that's the truth. And I think that leaning forward in developing innovative solutions is something that uh, I think the technology minded are going to do up front. Like we can, we can get into it, we can start figuring yeah. out those models, changing up the way things are, are being done and changing the dynamic and the shift. Because I, I think we all recognize if we continue in, in the path in which we're working right now, that when that 90 million hit that silver tsunami off of the backside, it's going to leave a gap. And, uh, and I love that you're starting to train the next uh, the next generation of folks that are going to sit out there. You, I mean, you talk through those numbers of 4 million different, you know, university level caregivers or people coming into that marketplace in a marketplace that is so absent and so short of enough people yeah. to get into it in the first place. And the tool being, if, if the tool being to that is really that gig economy, like great, great on you guys from that standpoint. But I'd, I'd also state, you know, if you're out there with a parent project and you're looking for where this goes, Look at look at within your own area to look, look within your family to find maybe that initiative. Do you have a do you have a niece? Do you have a nephew? Do you have something like that that they're just looking for that system that they could get onto that would make sense for them, or that that they're looking for that that soft touch, that bedside manner. This this could be a great training system for them to um, to be able to learn how to get into the game. Tell us where where are you guys where are you guys at? What's your focus right now, and 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 how how do you want to tackle America? Yeah, uh, great question. So, you know, very pleased to say that we were building it out of our home base in North Carolina. And over the last couple of years, we had just gradually expanded across North Carolina and we're entering South Carolina. And then in the last two months, it kind of went viral on the college student side across campuses all over the country. So now we are absolutely scrambling um, to build out presences all across the Northeast. Uh, we're in the Boston area. Uh, we're all over the Midwest now, Michigan, Ohio. Uh, Washington, D.C. We're actually entering Florida, Georgia. In your neck of the woods, we're actually expanding to Arizona as well as California. But kind of anywhere where there's a great university and a very large student population that wants to go into allied health fields. Uh, so because of that expansion um, and because we run the model for free, so we have zero um, advertising out there, it's been very grassroots. Um, yeah, we'd love to kind of like collaborate with people, help serve people with care needs. You know, if, if you live within 30 minutes of a major university, you know, reach out to us, you know, if we already probably are building carry out there, and if not, we'd be happy to build it for you. Um, you know, we think the model is viable, you know, kind of anywhere around the country. And as it grows, it's becoming kind of like a flywheel effect where students are telling friends at other schools um, and people are hearing stories of, you know, some of the people featured even in the video, we've helped them get into medical school. We've helped them get into MT programs. We've helped them get into PA programs. So I think it's becoming like a workforce development uh, play for students. So yeah, we're like expanding very rapidly across the country. So we're always like looking for people to help with care. We're looking for like healthcare systems to partner with just kind of any other organizations that might be interested in. Well, look, in us. And we saw your guys' website up there. How about social media? Uh, where can people find you guys on social media? Yeah, I'd say are probably most active. We're pretty active on um, LinkedIn, interestingly enough. Uh, so it's uh, at Carry Eye on LinkedIn. Um, and then also we're very active on Instagram and Facebook. And it's the same handle at we are Carry Eye. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out on any of the socials. Um, you know, we'd love to kind of like collaborate there and send us a DM. Uh, you know, we have um, somebody on our team is always checking and then we're always like looking to engage with and cross promote kind of people, share their stories, things like that. You know, it's like a great way to build awareness. I love it. And, you know, Neil Shaw, Carrie Yaya, uh, fantastic new approach into the marketplace, use of technology, that, that build of empathy, that practical experience, that kinetic experience that's something that just was sucked out of, out of the economy for so long and sucked out of the, the experience. Uh, I just good on you for what you guys are doing off of that. I hope that uh, I hope the best for you and your companies we go forward. I imagine we'll we'll know each other for some time and continue to fall back. We'll have, to, we'll have you back on the show. Yeah, yeah, Tony. Thanks very much for the opportunity, and you know, thanks thanks everyone for taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. It was wonderful. Thank you for sharing your time, talents, and treasures with us and our audience. Take care. Well, that's it for the team this week, and thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed the content, remember to subscribe and to share this episode on the app that you're using right now. Your reviews and your comments, they really help us expand our reach as well as our perspective. So if you have time, also drop us a note. Let us know how we're doing. 
For tips and tools to clarify your parent project, simplify communication with your stakeholders, and verify the professionals that you choose, you can find us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for trusting us. Until our next episode, behold and be held. Thank you for listening to this Parent Projects podcast production. To access our show notes, resources, or forums, join us on your favorite social media platform or go to parentprojects.com. This show is for informational and educational purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional credential in your local area. This show is copyrighted by Family Media and Technology Group Incorporated and Parent Projects LLC. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcast.